In this volume, dominant eigenvalues are going to play a larger role in linear systems than they did back in 2D. Let's update our 2D understanding of this phenomena to arbitrary dimensions. Do you remember when we did dominant eigenvalues back in volume 2? In that context, if we had a linear system with a pair of real distinct eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, then we said that in continuous time, lambda 1 dominates lambda 2 if it is bigger than lambda 2. If it's strictly bigger than lambda 2, it's the dominant eigenvalue. On the other hand, in discrete time, we had to be a little more careful. We had to say that lambda 1 dominates if it's bigger than lambda 2 in absolute value. Now, the reason we did this is that it influenced the asymptotics of solutions as time goes to infinity. So what we want to do is update this to higher dimensions. And in that context, as we have seen, we have lots of eigenvalues. Lambda 1, lambda 2, all the way up through lambda k. Here's our definition. Lambda 1 is said to be the dominant eigenvalue if... In continuous time, this lambda 1 is strictly bigger than the real portions of all the other eigenvalues. Now, why do we need that? Oh, the other eigenvalues might be complex. Aha. And in discrete time, what we need is that lambda 1, in absolute value, is bigger than lambda j in absolute value for all other values of j. That one looks very similar. Oh, but wait. Oh, no. This is not absolute value. Because those may be complex eigenvalues, this is modulus, that radial component in the complex plane. By this definition, it is implied that the dominant eigenvalue must be real. To which you might ask, well, what if all the eigenvalues are complex? What if they're all repeated? Well, there is no guarantee that a dominant eigenvalue exists. It may or may not exist. But if it does exist, it must be real. Now, why are we so worried about this? Well, dominance determines asymptotic behavior over time. Whether we're in a continuous or a discrete time system, whether we've got a kth order equation or a matrix equation, if your linear system has a dominant eigenvalue, lambda 1, then you can say what the long-term behavior is going to look like. In continuous time, a kth order equation, your solution, x of t, is going to asymptotically look like some constant times e to the lambda 1 t. In discrete time, xn is going to approach c, some constant, times lambda 1 to the n. If, on the other hand, you don't have a kth order equation, you have a matrix equation, either dx equals ax or ex equals ax, then you can say even a little bit more. In the continuous time case, your vector x of t is going to approach some constant times e to the lambda 1t times v1, the dominant eigenvector associated with that dominant eigenvalue. And in discrete time, we get the same thing. Your solution is asymptotically a constant times lambda 1 to the n times v1. That is very important. We're going to make great use of this in chapters to come. And because it's so useful, the big question is, does my linear system have a dominant eigenvalue? You've got a couple of options at your disposal to answer that. You can, of course, just compute all the eigenvalues and compare them. That's never a bad thing to do, but it may be difficult. Sometimes there are automatic guarantees. Here's a wonderful theorem from linear algebra. This is called the perron frobenius theorem, and it says that if you have a square matrix A, all of whose entries are positive, strictly positive, then A has a dominant eigenvalue, and its eigenvector has all positive terms. That works for continuous or discrete time. Very nice when you can use that. 
And speaking of use, you may be a little frustrated that we haven't used any of these tools yet. Those applications will come, but we need more theory in order to be able to fully deal with linear systems.